Absolute inability to see any of you, I, I can tell now. Um, I, I, I can't uh, do anything without my laptop. So I, I've read a lot of questions. I, I hope this answers all the questions that I was handed on cards. Uh, if not, you know, demand that I answer them. But I, I've written down some things that we can do and that we can know uh, for people in Ukraine uh, and the world. We can send aid to Ukrainian friends and aid organizations. We can send aid to organizations helping refugees leaving Ukraine. We can send aid especially that will reach those being refused help for racist reasons. We can share the remarkable media coverage uh, of war victims in Ukraine, and we can take the opportunity to point out the war victims in Yemen and Syria and Ethiopia and Sudan and Palestine and Afghanistan. <laughs> to question whether the lives of all war victims matter. We can take the opportunity to point out that the US government arms most of the world's worst dictators and oppressive governments, and we have a lot more funds for humanitarian aid if it didn't. Come on. We can take the opportunity to point out that the proper response to a horrific crime by the Russian government is not the crime of economic sanctions that harm ordinary people, but the prosecution of those responsible in a court of law. Sadly, the US government has spent decades tearing down the International Criminal Court, which has thus far only prosecuted Africans. And if it were to start prosecuting non-Africans and be credible and supported globally, it would have to prosecute quite a few people in the United States and Western Europe. I don't think a proper balance of power is going to save us, but the globalization and universalization of power. Russia is violating numerous treaties that the US government is one of the few holdouts on joining. This is a chance to consider fully supporting the rule of law. We should condemn the Russian use of cluster bombs, for example, without pretending that the United States doesn't use them. The risk of nuclear apocalypse is very high right now. There is nothing more important than avoiding destroying all life on Earth. We cannot picture a planet devoid of life and happily think, well, at least we stood up to Putin, or, well, at least we stood up to NATO, or, well, we had principles. Quite apart from where this war goes or where it came from, the US and Russia should be talking right now about taking nuclear weapons out of the calculations, disarming and dismantling, as well as protecting nuclear power plants. While we have been sitting in this room, a nuclear power plant in Ukraine has been shot at and is now burning next to five other nuclear power plants and firefighters rushing to the fire are being shot. Oh, shit. How is that for an image of humanity's priorities? The war is important enough to shoot the sons of bitches who are running to the fire to put out a fire in a nuclear power plant. 40 years ago, nuclear apocalypse was a top concern. The risk of it is now higher, but the concern is gone. So this is a teaching moment, and we may not have many of those left. This can also be a teaching moment for the abolition, wonderful word, abolition, of war, Woo! not just of some of its weapons. It's important for us to understand that almost every war kills, injures, traumatizes, and makes homeless mostly people on one side, mostly civilians, and disproportionately the poor, the elderly, and the young, just usually not in Europe. It's important for us to understand that keeping militaries around kills vastly more people than the wars do, and that this will be true until the wars become nuclear. This is because 3% of just US military spending could end starvation on Earth. Militaries divert resources from environmental and human needs, including disease pandemics as well as preventing global cooperation on pressing emergencies, severely damaging the environment, eroding civil liberties, weakening the rule of law, justifying government secrecy, corroding culture and fueling bigotry. Historically, the United States has seen an upsurge in racist violence following each major war, as have other countries. Militaries also make those they are supposed to protect less rather than more safe. 
when the U.S. builds bases, it gets more wars. Where it blows people up, it gets more enemies. Most wars have U.S. weapons on both sides because it's a business. And the fossil fuel business, which will kill us more slowly, is also at work here. Germany has canceled the Russian pipeline and will be destroying the earth with more U.S. fossil fuels. Oil prices are up. Weapons company stocks are up. Yeah. Poland is buying billions of dollars of U.S. tanks. Ukraine and the rest of Eastern Europe and other members of NATO are all going to buy a lot more U.S. weapons or have the U.S. give them to them. Mm. Slovakia has new U.S. bases. Also up our media ratings. And down is any attention to student debt or education or housing or wages or the environment or retirement or voting rights. We should remember that no crime excuses any other, that blaming anyone does not absolve anyone else, and recognize that the solutions now being offered of more weapons and a bigger NATO are also what got us here. Nobody's forced to commit mass murder. The president of Russia and the Russian military elites may simply love war and have wanted an excuse for one, but they would not have had any excuse for one had the perfectly reasonable demands they've been making been met. When Germany reunited, the U.S. promised Russia no NATO expansion. Mm -hmm. Many Russians hoped to be part of Europe and NATO, but promises were broken and NATO expanded. Top U.S. diplomats like George Kennan, people like the current director of the CIA, thousands of smart observers warned that this would lead to war. So did Russia. NATO is a commitment of each member to join in any war that any other member gets in. It is the very madness that created World War I. No country has a right to join NATO, to join it. A country has to agree to its war pact and all the other members have to agree to include that country in joining all of its wars. When NATO destroys Afghanistan or Libya, the number of members doesn't make the crime more legal. Trump supposedly opposing NATO doesn't make NATO a good thing. What Trump did was get NATO members to buy more weapons. With enemies like that, NATO doesn't need friends. Ukraine became independent of Russia when the Soviet Union ended and kept Crimea, which Russia had given it. Ukraine was divided ethnically and linguistically, but turning that divide violent took decades of effort by NATO on one side and Russia on the other. Both tried to influence elections, and in 2014, the U.S. facilitated a coup. The president fled for his life, and a U.S.-backed president came in. Ukraine banned the Russian language in various fora, and Nazi elements killed Russian speakers. No, Ukraine is not a Nazi country, but there are Nazis in Ukraine, and in Russia, and in the United States. Come on. That was the context of the vote in Crimea to rejoin Russia. That was the context of the separatist efforts in the East, where both sides have fueled violence and hatred for eight years. Agreements negotiated called the Minsk II agreements provided self-governance for two regions, but Ukraine did not comply. The Rand Corporation, an arm of the US military, wrote a report pushing to arm Ukraine to drag Russia into a conflict that would damage Russia and create protests in Russia. A fact that should not stop our support for protests in Russia, but make us careful about what they lead to. President Obama refused to arm Ukraine, predicting it would lead to where we are now. Trump and Biden armed Ukraine and all of Eastern Europe, and Ukraine mm -hmm. built up a military on one side of Donbass and Russia on the other, and both claiming to act defensively. Russia's demands have been to get missiles and weapons and troops and NATO away from its borders. Exactly what the U.S. demanded when the USSR put missiles in Cuba. Talk about the it. U.S. refused to meet any such demands. Russia had choices other than war. Russia was making a case to the global public, evacuating people threatened in Ukraine and mocking the predictions of an invasion every day. Russia could have embraced the rule of law and aid while Russia's military costs 8% what the U.S. spends, that is still enough that either Russia or the U.S. could have filled Donbass with unarmed civilian protectors and de-escalators, could have funded educational programs across the world on the value of cultural diversity in friendships and communities and the abysmal failures of racism, nationalism, and Nazism, filled Ukraine with the world's leading solar, wind, and water energy production facilities, 
replace the gas pipeline through Ukraine and never built one north of there with electric infrastructure for Russia and Western Europe, kicked off a global reverse arms race, joined human rights and disarmament treaties, joined the International Criminal Court. And Ukraine has alternatives right now. People in Ukraine are stopping tanks unarmed, are changing street signs, are blocking roads, are putting up billboard messages to Russian troops, are talking Russian troops out of the tanks and out of the war. Biden praised these actions in the State of the Union. We should demand that media outlets cover them. There are many examples in history of nonviolent action defeating coups, occupations, and invasions. If either the US or Russia had tried for years not to win Ukraine to its camp, but to train Ukrainians in non-cooperation, Ukraine would not be possible to occupy. So we have to stop saying, I'm against all war except this one every time there's a new war. We have to support alternatives to war. Yes. We have to start spotting propaganda. We have to stop obsessing over the few foreign dictators that the U.S. doesn't fund or arm. We can join in solidarity with courageous peace activists in Russia and Ukraine. We can seek out ways to volunteer for nonviolent resistance in Ukraine. We can support groups like Nonviolent Peace Force that have greater success unarmed than do armed U.N. troops we call peacekeepers. We can tell the U.S. government that there is no such thing as lethal aid Uh, and that we insist on actual aid and serious diplomacy and an end to NATO expansion. We can demand that with the U.S. media now liking peace demonstrations, it covers some of the peace demonstrations here in the United States and include some anti-war voices like those in this room. We can turn out at the White House at 3 o'clock on Sunday of this week to demand Russia out of Ukraine and NATO out of existence. Look at And we And people who have money can support groups, peace groups like Code Pink. Thank you very much, y'all, for being here.